Candace Burfock is I love you. Please come on the show. You're so sexy. You ride motorcycles. You have a very rich wife. That's cool. I don't have an issue with that. A lot of people would yell at you if they knew that about you and say you're fake socialist. But, you know, love you in general. You're sick. I'm saying it. What is this? Well, the good news is that the left of center thinkers and writers haven't largely bitten or any other recent American misadventure abroad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, I said, yeah, I saw this as well. Osita says, I've said this before and I'll say it again. A lot of foreign policy minds are eager for a war with China. They have access to the main organs of elite opinions in this country and resisting them will be one of the most important causes of the century. It's done, though. It's so Jover. It's, it's so Jover. The paradox is that in the West, reputation is the weapon used by the powerful to remove anything challenging to capital. Faux freedom of ideas. You can't say anything that has an effect on power. Yeah, but you don't understand. Everyone that is a heterodox thinker or someone that is actually straight away from uh, American foreign policy goals globally is always suspiciously a bad guy, always. But like Henry Kissinger, good guy, perfectly comfortable and uh, still ready to give advice to every American administration. That's a good guy. His hands are bloody, okay? Uh, guy who has openly stated uh, his, his uh, bloodthirst time and time again, that's a good guy. The other guy's like Noam Chomsky, or Parenti, or any number of other uh, thinkers that are not uh, inside of that same uh, mentality. Well, they're all bad. They're all bad. They're all bad for one reason or another. You know? I saw someone call Yanis Varoufakis a tanky. Wait, someone sent me a clip of Yanis Varoufakis' uh, opinion on, on Chinese loans, which I kind of want to talk about. But before that, I want to talk about are this. Are we liberals or are we not? Do, we want, do you really? Yanis Varoufakis, I love you. Please come on the show. You're so sexy. You ride motorcycles. You have a very rich wife. That's cool, in my opinion. I don't have an issue with that. Uh, a lot of people would yell at you if they knew that about you and say you're fucking fake socialist. Maybe a little bit too much of a, you know, a, a, a pan-euro. Not supremacist. Nowhere near as bad as Slavo Zizek. But, you know, love you in general. You're sick. You're fucking sick. You, you tell me. I mean, once upon a time, there were no passports. There the world is. was much a much better place. Oh, I've, I've literally watched this before. Where he died. Or, look, LGBT. Are we look at how fucking charismatic he is. He's so hot. Hey, but also, are we not? Do, we well, want, do you really you, want you, borders? You tell me. I mean, once upon a time, there were no passports. The world was much a much better place. When Lord Byron went to Greece, where he died, or Lord Elgin, for that matter, mm -hmm. he didn't need a passport. What was wrong with that? I think borders are a sign of failure of the human species. It's very relevant right now because the UK is currently having a, a, a lot of debate about immigration. You shouldn't be having this debate. It is a misanthropic, stupid debate. And you have a minister who should have been expelled from this country for having these ideas. She, I mean, she even challenged the U United Nations Charter on Refugees. I mean, this... He always says borders are a scar on our earth. This, this is, this is. A, she suggested it might have been an outdated, idiot. an outdated <laughs> legal mechanism to she resolve that problem. She's a dangerous, problem. poor excuse of human nature. But That's the well, people who, the people who are Be anxious, very ashamed of her. But the people who are anxious about this issue are the people you are trying to look after. Sure. There are people who. My job is not, well, no, is not to pander to anxieties that are absolutely false consciousness examples. Look, Freddie, we Europeans exported hordes, hordes of people. We emigrated to the four corners of the universe, of the universe, of the planet. Huh? We populated the earth from Latin America to North America to Asia to Africa. Millions, usually armed as well, right? <laughs> as imperialists. Uh, we had no qualms about that for a thousand years. All that has happened is that we're getting old. Demographically, we are aging. So, you know, migratory flows have reversed. We need migrants. The more the merrier. Why do people worry about the Romanians living next door to them? It's because the flats have been privatized. They used to be council houses and now they are being privatized and austerity together with largesse for the finances through quantitative easing has destroyed the foundation of the society even if you didn't have a single foreigner. All this angst and... The British would not have these considerations if uh, council homes and flats uh, were not allowed to be purchased wholesale, which immediately shrunk up the uh, available housing and, uh, and, and created a negative incentive to continue building more housing, as a matter of fact. Just a thought. Uh, another neoliberal 
psychopathic, monstrous, pedophile defending freakazoid Margaret Thatcher. Rage is being diverted as in the mid war period against the Jew, the Muslim, the Romanian, the Brit, the German, the foreigner. We must not tolerate that and we must never pander to that and say, oh, the solution is to erect taller fences. No. This guy had a great take on BRICS and why it's not challenging America? Wait, really? I, didn't, I have oh, not, not heard that. Those people who you don't want to tolerate prefer. I mean the politicians. I would, I'm talking about voters who, no, 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 who no. might have, I, who might have I ideas. I tolerate that you every don't voter. Like. And Yanis is a pan-European future leftist block against U.S. financial power and influence kind of way. EU is a massive consumer population, which the EU doesn't utilize uh, to bargain because they're U.S. lackeys. Yes, the only criticism that I think is appropriate for Yanis Varoufakis, well, there's two. One, he's too much of a pan-Europeanist guy, okay? So there is truth to that. Uh, like DM25 gets a little too like, like I look, I'm no Maoist third worldist, right? I love my fucking luxury goods and, and I talk about it quite frequently. And I think that like consumption is a necessity to dull the masses. And there are lessons to be learned from uh, neoliberal mechanisms of control and yada, yada, yada. These are things that I've described pl uh, plenty of fucking times. Having said that, however, I do think that, I do think that Giannis Varoufakis, maybe not him as much, but like some of the other DM25 guys are maybe a little bit too much of a, like a uh, Europe is supreme type dudes. You know what I mean? Station with them. Whereas oh, every voter, like. and okay. I respect every voter. Okay. But, but I engage in conversation with them. Whereas Ms. Braverman is trying to poison the soul of everyone for her own very narrow interests of political survival of a government that is nasty oh god don't say that don't bring up because that that brings me to my second that brings me to my second criticism of Giannis Varoufakis and I don't know if I should actually tell you guys this as a matter of fact, I probably won't. Never mind. Let's not worry about it. Do not Google what Yanis Varoufakis uh, did at Valve. Do not do that. If anybody fucking tells you that he worked at Valve, that's a lie. Valve and Yanis Varoufakis never worked together. And he certainly did not build the microtransaction uh, economy inside of uh, Valve when he was there. But it was a cooperative. It was a cooperative. I say he was too good of an economist. So yes, in some ways he, in some ways he did participate in Valve never bringing out Half Life Three or any other games. And if you if you have an issue with Valve no longer making video games, but the Steam Deck is really good, I will suck and fuck Gaben all day. Steam Deck, excellent product, love that shit. Okay, I ride for it, I die for it, I talk about it all the time. See, they still make good stuff. Not not games, which they used to make really good games, but um, but maybe uh, you know the the maybe the the marketplace is uh, far too viable of a product, a, a revenue generator for Steam to focus on anything else. Maybe, just saying. Steam Deck amazing, going on fifteen months with mine. Yeah, evil and its life should be as as short as possible. He likes crypto. Wait, what? No. What? Please don't say that. I, I haven't really kept up with Giannis Varoufakis for a very for some time, but I d fucking doubt that he likes crypto. No shot. Former Valve economist calls Facebook's metaverse a Steam-like digital economy with Zuckerberg as his techno lord. Giannis Varoufakis also discussed pay to earn and the blockchain's long-term consequences. Okay, so you guys were just lying about former Greek minister. Uh, and and current sexy man, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, fucking liars. Another aspect of of uh, ideological allegiances that I have with Yanis Varoufakis is that he, much like myself, believes in uh, reversing the role of the European Union instead of like trying to balkanize it or let it wither away and utilize it as a as a means of, of uh, doing equal trade rather than the current unequal trade, which I know a, a lot of people don't like that. I don't have an issue with the EU's existence. I have an issue with what the EU is uh, there to do as it stands. What's wrong about DM25? Nothing. I don't, I don't have an issue with it. Um... 
Where was, oh, here is Yanis Varoufakis talking about China. In Africa, they're, they're lending money to countries to build ports and different infrastructure. To, to build what? Port, And harbors, what's wrong with that? And, well, because... Countries that need ports. <laughs> Get ports. But they're making people dependent on, I mean, I know, it's the same thing that we've done. They're making people dependent on that good Chinese money. And, which is no, it's not. All around the world, they, are, they are far more humanistic than the United States ever was. <laughs> Welcome to Candid Africa, truthful and unapologetic. I've been very concerned lately about China. They are now all over Africa, you know, buying things and investing over there and getting those countries dependent on them and supporting, you know, non-democratic people. And <laughs> I'm just... Like <laughs> well... We, come, we are in a country that supports Saudi Arabia. Yes, that's yeah. true. Right. So, so suddenly we have a problem with. Well, what about us? Um, what, what about us? Um, that's fucked up. What about us? It's, uh, you know, superpowers supporting non democratic people. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes, I do. You know, they're, they're in Africa. Yeah. A note on autonomy or a note on democracy. Do you feel like you have any say in American governance? Technically, you vote. Right, you can vote for one party over the other, and they have some marginal differences. But do they ask you what to do? You know what I mean? Do you have any say whatsoever? So if you, as an American citizen, who would much rather, let's say, not have this expansive, ever expanding military budget, and instead would focus on, uh, you know, fixing America's infrastructure, uh, offering better uh, uh, training programs and integration programs for the oncoming migrants that are climate refugees, as well as refugees of America's fuckery in those nations. Uh, if you believe that uh, we should be spending our dollars on ourselves and, and uh, education and health care and housing and fixing these uh, economic problems that we are causing for ourselves, and yet you have no say... Okay, and America keeps doing whatever the fuck it wants to, the American behemoth. Then what the fuck are we doing talking about like Chinese autonomy? Like to me, that is an incredibly unself aware perspective to take. We're just yapping. It's the same principle behind like the the giving money to Ukraine and giving weapons to Ukraine. Everyone's like, oh Sam, blah, blah, blah. You have this opinion, you have that opinion. It's like, bitch, you think you have a say in this process? You don't. You, you have no say in this process. America autonomy is being able to say slur is true. There is freedom there. <sighs> anyway. The reason why the BRICS... Let's watch this. They're, Let's they're lending money to countries to build ports and different to, infrastructure. To build what? Port And harbors. what's wrong with that? And, well, because... Countries that need ports. <laughs> Get ports. But they're making... Uh, well, actually, Giannis, um, technically, when slavers came to Africa, in order to, and, and colonizers came to Africa, they technically built railroads. They built the railroads in India. Is that okay? Is that, is that for the same principle? Huh? 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 Wow, that's really fucked up. No, ports can be uh, uh, an act of colonial violence, as a matter of fact. Making people dependent on, I mean, I know, it's the same thing that we've done, which is no, it's not. all around the world. They are, but... they are far more humanistic than the United States ever was. <laughs> Really? Okay. Absolutely. Great. So let me give give you an okay. example. Of course, they are trying. They are peddling for in, for for influence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they are non-interventionist. Absolutely non-interventionist in a way that Europeans, the West, has never managed to fathom. When it comes to the influence of China outside its borders. Yeah. The criticism of Chinese development in Africa is always revol it always revolves around a hypothetical of like, what if they behave like we did? And it's like, okay, if you're African, if you're from an African nation, okay, and you saw violent colonialism and then also still violent uh, neo-colonialism in the form of economic imperialism, and then the other guys like here will give you like low interest loans and it's chill you know, do your thing. Like, yeah, you're probably going to be like, I don't know. I think I want it from these guys who are giving me better loan conditions and not trying to implement fucking uh, austerity measures. Like, why are you fucking worrying about it? 
That's why the, the classic thing I hear all the time is, what is it? When Europeans come, we get a lecture. When the Chinese come, we get a hospital. Now, that doesn't mean that, like, China's interests are you know, uh, honest and earnest in developing Africa. I don't think it is. But so far, at least Western powers have historically done such a piss poor job of, of robbing Africa for all of its natural resources that they're like, they seemingly are uh, relatively happy about uh, Chinese involvement instead. So if you are a real free market capitalist, as you claim that you are America and Western imperialist nations, then do capitalism. Offer even better fucking loans. I have to say, firstly, it's quite remarkable that they don't seem to have any military um, ambitions. Secondly, Africa. I'll give you an example, a specific example. Ethiopia. 2004, because it ha I happened to be there and I, I have some uh, first person, first hand experience of it. They've actually done a stellar job of robbing Africa. Thank you very much. Again, is Western cope, man. Are you Chinese? Am I Chinese? Do the Chinese even have a fucking say in what the, the Chinese government does? Do you have a say in what the American government does? It doesn't. None of us have any say in these processes whatsoever. Oh, you're talking about the West. Okay, I thought you were like, no, they're actually stealing African resources too. It's like, because I do hear that a lot, like all the fucking time from, you know, liberal perverts. But they went into Ethiopia. I'll tell you why they went into Ethiopia, because they suspected it was oil. <laughs> because China is a major industrial power, but it lacks primary resources. Now, instead of going into Africa with troops, colonially, destroying the country, killing people like the West has done for the last hundred years. What they did was they went to Addis Ababa and they said to the government, we would like, we can see you have prob problems with your infrastructure. We would like to build some new airports, um, upgrade your railway system, create a telephone system and rebuild your roads. And we'll do this all, f all for free. No strings attached. We don't want anything from you. And they did. Why did they do it? Because it's soft power. Because they, now, it, because they knew that if oil is uh, uh, discovered, and it was discovered later, then, of course, the Ethiopian government will be much more open to Chinese oil companies coming there. They have never combined their investment with imperialistic... Can you imagine if that was a German company or an American company? <laughs> That's why I'm saying I don't think you should worry. Okay. Yeah, they'd be like... Oh, are you trying to unionize, dude? Get the fuck out of here. We're going to take one incredibly militant, incredibly reactionary group of fucking powers. We're going to give them weapons and train them for like a month and a month and a half. And then we're going to sick them on your labor leaders and fucking execute them until you shut the fuck up. Which, by the way, still happens in nations that America is involved with in Africa to this fucking day. It's so bad overall that other marginally less imperialist yet still very much imperialist dog shit uh, 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 secondary superpowers that want to be superpowers actually get to make plays against for example French African colonies okay and yes I'm talking about Wagner they're not great they're fucking awful they and and even in that situation, these dudes are like, historically, we've been fucked over so hard by France that like, yeah, I don't know, maybe these guys will fuck us over a little bit. Fine. Okay, I won't. Thank you. There we have it. Let us know if you... Anyway. Chinese goal is to build up enough infrastructure to increase economic output in China, get a large share of that development, like resource extraction, manufacturing, trade deals. They're not hiding it either. It's openly their position. Oh, this one is the... In, uh, in Namibia, for example, the number of Chinese people living here in the meantime is four times as much as, for example, the German uh, community. It's, all, it's so condescending. It, it, it is like, it is very much uh, like we white people know better on how you should govern yourselves, even though we fucked you over and, and uh, basically anyone else that gives you infinitely more favorable deals, you will welcome with open arms. 
It is, it, it, like, here, you will see this condescension and the reaction in a moment. There is in, uh, in Namibia, for example, the number of Chinese people living here in the meantime is four times as much as, for example, the German uh, community. And it's so far, it's not precisely the same what takes place all over the world. There are differences. And what I'm... Mr. Speaker, yeah. what is your problem with that? Why does it become your problem? <laughs> it, looks, it looks like it's a more European problem than our problem. Yeah. Uh-huh. You are so sorry for us. <laughs> I don't see... Chinese will never come and play around here. As Germans not allowed to do that. Which Germans are doing, by the way. You talk about Chinese. We allow Germans to come off our visas here. Red carpet. Our people are harassed in Germany. Even diplomatic passport holders. In Germany. And you come in here, Germans come in here as they want. So why Chinese talk about Germans? How you are treating us there? Chinese don't treat us like that. Diplomatic passport holders. We will handle our own country. Don't be sorry for us. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Every <laughs> I mean. time Westerner comes, it's about Chinese. <laughs> yeah, they want partners, not subjects. A one-sided partnership. But it's like... Okay, to be fair, Africans would totally get harassed in China as well, but the rest is spot on. I've heard this as well. Like, the Chinese are not exactly super fond of, of um, African people going to China either, uh, but uh, I was in Kenya's February and the Chinese basically own all the highways and new roads. All right, all right, we're done. Uh, we're, we're train posting. This is like the last level of China posting is train posting. Once we get here, I wanted to hear from Yanis Varoufakis on, on BRICS. I did want to hear that. I want to hear what he had to say about that. And uh, you know what? We'll do all of Paul May. Why I'm a democratic socialist first for the European social democrats that haven't already left because they were throwing up pissing, shitting, and farting because European social democracy is the best possible way forward and they should keep being servile dogs to uh, to the American interests as their countries and the long, hard-fought social democratic policies that they currently still enjoy are becoming neoliberalized by the moment. Uh, but, you know, let's watch. Men låt mig få göra lite principiellt inlägg här. Feldin har du tjatat på mig. Jag ska tala om varför jag är socialist. Och jag är demokratisk socialism. Demokratisk med socialist. Och med glädje. Jag blev den här från kring Indien. Fucking tanky, dude. This fucking tanky piece of shit. Fuck this guy. Och såg den fruktansvärda fattigdomen. It's what I suspect his assassin said before killing him. <laughs> När jag får runt och såg en ännu mer förnedrande fattigdom på sätt och vis i Förenta staterna. När jag så mycket ung kom öga mot, med öga med kommunismens ofrihet och förtryck och människoförföljelse i, i kommuniststaterna. När jag kom till nazisternas koncentrationsläger och fick se dödslisterna på socialdemokrater och fackföreningsmän. Jag blev det när jag fick klart för mig att det var socialdemokratin som bröt marken his assassin probably said, I love apartheid. I'm also definitely not South African. Demokratin i Sverige. När jag fick klart för mig att det var socialdemokratin som lyft... When I understood it was social democracy that saved the country from poverty and unemployment. And when I got to personally fight for decent pensions for ordinarily blue-collar people back in the day. And when I got to personally fight for decent pensions for ordinary blue-collar people back in the day. I became one, one from years of working with former Prime Minister Erlander, where I learned what democracy and humanism are, and with close friends like Willy Brandt, Bruno Kreisi, and Trivge Bratelli. Who risked their lives for human dignity. But more importantly, my conviction grows stronger when I look at the world. When I see war, rearmament, mass unemployment, and class divides, my conviction grows stronger when I see growing unemployment, injustice, and financial speculation. 
When I see right-wing politics all over the world forcing people into unemployment, destroying social security and still not solving the economic problems, and when I look into the future, the conservatives seem to offer, where wage earners grow poorer and the wealthy grow richer, in which our safety nets is weakened and we have more luxury yachts, where solidarity is weaker and egotism stronger, those who are strong enrich themselves and the poor just have to cope with it. Certainly, I am a democratic socialist. I am proud of what this democratic socialism has accomplished in our country. I happily call myself a socialist because we have so many things left to deal with after all th these years of right-wing mismanagement. And I'm also confident because now our people know what happens to our jobs, our safety and stability when you are allowed to govern. In a way, I'm amused because I know that modern Swedish history is full of reforms which you call evil socialism but then you fight to take credit for them when people actually experience them which by the way in America we literally have like marginal just a crumb of like expansion of the welfare state which is exactly the same bullshit like even even in the Democratic Party everybody fights tooth and nail for any infrastructure spending and then those fucking scumbag pieces of shit on the right go back to their own fucking town halls in their own backyards and have the audacity to fucking claim ownership to claim ownership over those fucking provisions that they fought against tooth and nail every time i see that i want to fucking put you in jail dude i become this much more authoritarian okay Certainly, Feldin and Ulsten. I am a democratic socialist, like Brantik, when he gave everybody an equal vote, like Per Albin Hansen, when he fought unemployment in the 30s and introduced our social safety net, like Erlander. When he expanded that social safety net and gave us, because this is about being considerate and caring about other human beings. And what exactly are you, Feldin? Social democracy is a good start, depending on how reactionary your governance is, okay? It's a good start. But you need people to be passionate about being democratic socialists to fully achieve a transitional socialist state. Because social democracy still is under the banner of capitalism. And when you, are, when you remain under the banner of capitalism, you get to modern-day Sweden, okay? And modern-day Sweden has clawed back and fought tooth and fucking nail for all of the gains made by people like him, by social Democrats, okay? They've, they've eviscerated it year over year. And it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen overnight either. So it's a gradual process, a gradual process in which you don't even recognize that year over year, the government amenities that you are taking for granted are getting slowly but surely worse. How? By lowering taxes, by refu refusing to pay for these initiatives, ultimately crippling it so much that you have no other way but to privatize it. I'm sorry, we just got to privatize it. We got to privatize it. And then it's gone. Okay? Because the fascist, the reactionary, the capitalist knows full well that people don't want to give away amenities that they have. That's why it's almost impossible to fucking eviscerate social security. Republicans have had a 30, 40, 50 year project in trying to dismantle it and they haven't been able to because they recognize that people go, fuck you. I pay for this shit. I want it. I deserve it. This helps me survive. That's why the same goes for the NHS in the UK. But again, you get too comfortable under a social democracy and they'll take that shit away. 12 years of austerity under Tory leadership in the UK and look at how bad the NHS is. One day, they will privatize it, okay? First, they will starve it. Then, they will say, 
private enterprise can make up for the gaps in between. And before you know it, it's fucking gone. Government initiatives do not fail because they are burdened by big government or red tape or whatever the fuck these dumbass capitalists have been saying for years that, you know, somehow capitalist corporations are significantly more initiative, uh, not initiative, sorry, significantly more proficient and, and they eliminate uh, redundancies, okay? They say that all the time. It's not true. It's not true. But they know that you don't want to give up on the goodies that the government has given you, okay? More efficient, yes, I said initiative. <sighs> they cripple it. Social safety nets and amenities of, uh, offered by the government do not fail due to big government and, and, and a, lack of a lack of elimination of redundancies. They fail because they are deliberately underfunded with the express purpose of privatization, okay? Ronald Reagan called it starving the beast. That's it. They starve it. They Every year, they chip away. Every fucking year, they chip away piece by piece. And then before you know it, they're like, man, we just got to have private enterprise fill in the stop gaps, fill in the fucking gaps here. Before you know it, it's gone. It's no longer accessible to you. And you have a structure that is similar to the American healthcare that we have here. Okay? Paywalled. Unimaginably cruel. In the process, specifically in Sweden... They will point to refugees. They will point to this. They'll point to that. They don't have refugees. They'll point to homosexuality, indecency. You know what I mean? Whatever the fuck they consider to be the outgroup that is apt that you can propagandize against. That's what the reactionary does. If it's not the, the uh, moral degeneracy, then they'll point to other countries. You should be afraid of other countries. They're coming for you. There's always a different enemy waiting in the corner, in the shadows, to fuck you over, right? Because you feel the contradictions. They are impossible to avoid. So you feel them, and you feel angry, but if you do not have the right equipment, if you do not have the right information, then you're just angry for no reason. So the reactionary sees that and takes advantage of that and points your anger in the direction of whatever enemies there are in the shadows. But the enemies are not in the shadows. The enemies are in the C-suite. The enemies are sitting atop the corporate mountain. And the enemies are global. They're in every country. They're your neighbors. And they don't have to be enemies, really. They don't have to be your enemies. Okay? They can just step aside and magnanimously uh, allow you to, to make reforms slowly but surely. But they won't because they put profit over the interests of people, okay? That's it. No, they're not fucking globalists, man. What the hell are you talking about? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Motherfucker's manager or his boss in his small business is like, yeah, I don't care that your mom died. You can't go to her funeral. And then he goes, oh, is this the globalist that is like causing me, uh, uh, causing me to struggle? <laughs> it's like, no, man, it's right there. He's right there in front of you. Like, what are you talking about? Fucking globalist, dog. How about you worry about your own goddamn life? Republicans ruined any theory that sounds like a conspiracy. Anyway. <sighs> My enemies are people that lie about gaming happening. Wrap it up and get to cyberpunk. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, I want to hear... I want to hear about uh, Yanis Varoufakis talking about BRICS. It's not going to be a significant it's the last um, threat question. to the dollar. It's because Russian capitalists, Chinese capitalists, Indian capitalists, Indonesian capitalists, United Arab Emirates capitalists, they do not want to see the dollar being displaced by any currency, digital, crypto, or normal. That's right. They want the dollar to remain completely and utterly dominant because their loot, their wealth is in dollars and it lives in the United States financial system. Who came up with the acronym BRICS? A guy called O'Neill, Jim O'Neill. What was Jim O'Neill? The chief economist of Goldman Sachs. He came up with the idea of the BRICS. He was making the point that if you are investing money, you forget about the West, 
you should invest it in countries like Brazil, in Russia, in China. And in order to make it snazzy, to give it a marketing edge, I asked him, why, why, did, why did you put South Africa in there, the S of BRICS, once I met Jim Manuel? Do you know what he said to me? Because, because brick, one brick didn't sound good, and I wanted an S. So he added South Africa in there. So this is the degree of Anglo, European, American dominance. All the developing world is looking at the BRICS as their savior, and the BRICS is an acronym concocted by the chief economist of Goldman Sachs, right? Now, it's not insignificant. It's not insignificant because an increasing amount of international trade is not going to be in dollars. And I think the most interesting event of the last weeks is when we heard that Argentina. That's why I always laugh on like leftists on the, the fucking, you know, anti-imperialist leftists on Twitter, are like the BRICS is rising up. I'm like, dude, none of these nations are these, every single member state in BRICS is literally more connected to the fucking dollar than they are connected ideologically. Like, there is no coalition there. You know what I mean? They, they don't have the same fucking worldview or opinions. They're just trying to leverage, trying to hedge their bets. And he paid a few billion dollars that it owed to the International Monetary Fund using Chinese one. If you couple that with the news that uh, the new development bank which is the BRICS bank, where Dilma is the president, the former Brazilian president, is going to be lending in local currencies. And also there is another outfit of the BRICS, a separate outfit, that is going to try to replace the IMF. So one, when one country, which is associated with the BRICS, let's say South Africa, um, or you know any other country that joins the BRICS in some associative war, when they have a problem with the balance of payments, when they can't repay their bankers in Germany, their bankers in England, their bankers in France, in America, then this BRICS IMF version of the IMF will come in and lend them in local currencies. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean to be lent in local currencies? Well, when Argentina repaid its IMF installment, was something like four or five billion dollars, using one. All right. What that means is this, the Chinese repaid it using their own dollar stock. If, they, if, if this new development bank and the Dilma lends to Argentina or to South Africa or to Zambia, if they lend money in local currency in South Africa rand to the South African government, what does that mean? I mean, the, 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 the BRICS bank does not have around to give what it has is dollars okay or one it can give them one or it can give them dollars now for that loan to south africa to be useful to south africa the south africans the south, south african man, uh, government that takes on this loan must be able to buy stuff from america from europe from india they will have to pay in dollars so essentially, they get dollars from the BRICS bank, but they have to repay in the future with interest the dollars that it cost initially to give the rand. What does this mean? It means that if the rand devalues 50% in the next 10 years, when the, the loan has to be repaid, this is a good thing for South Africa because South Africa will have inflation. The same quantity of rand in 10 years' time will be worth half as much. So they effectively will have to be repaid to the BRICS bank half the money. So it's negative interest rates for the BRICS bank. Who is going to suffer for this? The Chinese, because they are, only, they are the only ones amongst the BRICS that have a big wad of dollars. So essentially, the BRICS bank means that the Chinese are using their stock of dollars in order to lend the countries that take loans from the BRICS bank and take on itself, Beijing will take on its shoulders, the devaluation risk, which now, when an African country borrows, 
Uh, the devaluation risk is its own. It will have to, to pay for it. Now, why would the Chinese do that? Well, one reason is because they have too many dollars. <laughs> In the sense that, you know, because they have a very large current account surplus, they keep, with every lump of aluminum or car or whatever it is that they hold clothes that they sell to the Americans or to the Europeans, they get dollars back, right? What do they do with these dollars? They have to take them to Wall Street. Now, they've seen what happened after the Ukraine war, that the Central Bank of the United States, the Fed, confiscated 350 billion Russian dollars. So they think, oh, they, can, they may do this to, to, to us. We might as well use our dollars through the BRICS network to gain more influence over South Africa, over Saudi Arabia. So they are socializing amongst the third world, what we used to call the third world, huh? they are dollar holdings. So the BRICS is China. Let's not be, let's not beat about the bush here. The BRICS is China with India uh, trying to find a kind of middle road with um, the United, United Arab Emirates playing the West against the BRICS uh, in order to gain advantages like Saudi Arabia wants to negotiate deals. They don't want to get out of the dollar zone, but they want to enhance their relationship with with China, with the BRICS, in order to leverage their own bargaining with uh, the United States. This is all very interesting. But leftists, I, I'm really appalled. Leftists have a tendency to look at the BRICS and say, oh, this, you know, we'll, we are orphans. We in the left are, since 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we've been orphaned. We've been looking at a large power internationally that will look after us, that we will be able to dream that they are our people, that they will defeat the capitalist mammoth, right? Don't make this mistake. That's not what the BRICS is. It's significant. I explained why it is significant, but it is not. Are left super happy about BRICS? Yes, they misunderstand it and think that like BRICS will be able to de-dollarize or something, or, or we'll be able to put up a competitive currency. But as I've said already, that it's like, that's not a real prospect at all, considering that all trade is is conducted on the dollar, pretty much. The new communist international, the new socialist. It's it's specifically uh, hedging your bets. That's it. Building new developments uh, or, or building new relationships and hedging your bets against America with another trade partner that uh, is, is offering better uh is offering better terms that's it which is completely understandable if you're stuck between a rock and a hard place is to leverage their money like he said a second ago the west took 250 billion from russia so everyone fears that that could be them one day yeah yeah i i know that's why i'm saying that's precisely the reason why i'm saying that okay not noam chomsky is important context is currently almost all international trade is conducted in the u.s dollar this is true even if not between the U.S., also true. So that's the main desire for an alternative. There is a desire for an alternative. There is no alternative. Because even with the Chinese, there it's still on the dollar. It's the national, the new, and you know, um, humanist international. That's not what it is. Yes. And the desire isn't really there because the currency itself doesn't matter much at the end of the day. I don't, I don't agree with that. No, I think that if, if given an alternative, plenty of countries that, are, that have been burned by the United States in the past would absolutely move away from the dollar. It's just that there is no other alternative. That's crazy to say. Are you kidding me? I mean, Yanis Varoufakis is 100% correct with his uh, assessment on Russia. Ruble hit $100 today. Hassan's allowances will be reduced. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Moldova Mama Liga. No. No. It's, I get all my money from the Kremlin. And not from you guys who want to avoid the top of the hour ad break at the top of every hour who give me $5 a month. Like Moldovan Mama Liga, ironically, has been doing for 44 months straight. <laughs> uh, fucking guy, dude. The Kremlin can't come near the, the grassroots power that this community is, is backed by.
Here's the Thurman Arm right now.